Okay, it's official. Everyone has gone chat GPT crazy, and with good reason, it's some pretty cool technology. Bill Gates himself, just in his latest newsletter, said it's the most impressive technology revolution he's seen since he first witnessed the graphical user interface. Definitely some high praise coming from my personal favorite futurist. But here's the thing, I think it is amazing technology and everybody is massively underestimating the power of generative AI. Everyone seems to be hyper-focused on how ChatGPT is gonna help you do your homework or write an email, which I think completely underestimates the true impact that this technology is going to have on our economy. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how generative AI is going to be a much bigger revolution than everyone is giving it credit for. Let's go. I'm Ami Iqbal from Five Ways to Innovate. On this channel, I share insights and stories from my 20 plus years leading innovation at some of the world's top companies, including Facebook and Deloitte Digital. So you've probably seen loads of posts on LinkedIn and other social media raving about how great the new version of ChatGPT is and how somebody has used it to write an email to plan their travel itinerary or do their homework for them. Brilliant. It all sounds really amazing. But as I said up top, I think it's a complete underestimation of what this technology can do for us. So as I always like to do, let's crack open the history books and see where we've observed something like this in the past. Back in the Industrial Revolution, we had loads and loads of factories. That was the main economy back in those days. Now, how were those factories powered? Well, we had somebody shoveling coal that was burnt, the heat energy then boiled some water, the water created steam, the steam spanned some turbines, and that kinetic energy was used to power a whole bunch of machines that were operated by human beings. Okay, all seems a little bit inefficient. Then along comes this invention called electricity, and you would have thought that would revolutionize everything overnight. But actually what happened? Well, they used the electricity just to replace this whole coal spinning turbines business to essentially just power the same factories that are still operated by human beings. The shift work is still operating in much the same way as it was before. It was actually quite some time before some bright spark realized, hey, what if we just plug this electricity into the source and replace these machines with machines that can operate 24 seven. They don't need human intervention or human supervision. We can massively reduce the staff, we can reduce our operating costs, and we can produce things much faster, 24 seven around the clock, more than we ever could before. More and more factories opened, and that literally changed the face of the world's economy. In much the same way, I kind of feel the conversation with generative AI right now is, yeah, it's gonna help me write an email. That's the equivalent of saying, let's just replace burning coal and spinning turbines with this hugely powerful thing that could actually be plugged in at the source to create a much bigger bank. I mentioned Bill Gates before, and he's written probably what I've seen as the best newsletter talking about the larger, longer term impact of generative AI that's upcoming in this wave. Unsurprisingly, given the charitable work that he does with his foundation, a lot of what he's spoken about is the ability for generative AI to benefit underprivileged societies. One of the industries in particular that he's called out is, of course, healthcare. There's still 5 million children under the age of five who die each year. This is something that AI could massively help to disrupt and save literally millions of lives. However, after giving this whole spiel about how it's going to help underprivileged societies, he goes on to say something quite interesting. Market forces won't naturally produce AI products and services that help the poorest. The opposite is more likely. So what he's saying there is, no one's going to take this brand new technology and immediately think of applying it to a charitable effect. It's probably going to filter down to people like you and me first. As I always love to say, follow the money. Where is healthcare going to be disrupted by AI in a way where there's an economic opportunity to serve customers like you and me? Back in 2013, I had an article published called Winning at Life. And it was all about how data collection is transforming our lives. Now, keep in mind, this was back in 2013. So the most popular app going around at the time was called Foursquare, if anyone remembers that. The idea and the thrust behind my article was to say, well, we have all these devices now like smartphones and fitness trackers that can measure our personal data. What if we were using this for more than just becoming the mayor of your local coffee shop or earning badges or tracking your run on any given day? Could there actually be a larger industry built around using these personal analytics 
to optimize our actual health. Now the premise here is that the medical industry is still based on an almost 200 year old model. I have a symptom like a cough, I go and see my doctor, I describe my cough, the doctor does a couple of tests in the space of five minutes and gives me some medicine to walk away. Now if that cough is a symptom of a larger illness, I'm probably already too late to catch it. This system is rife for disruption and AI is the perfect thing to do it. So at the time I came up with a three horizon model for how I see AI disrupting the healthcare industry. Horizon One has been around for over 10 years now. It's called Devices. And the goal here is data collection. Think of it as a way to collect your personal data continuously, ambiently, and without the need for any kind of data entry. Of course, by now we are all familiar with these sort of things. I'm wearing an Aura ring. Everybody's wearing an Apple Watch these days. There are Garmin technologies out there. There are lots and lots of devices that measure different parts of our body. Heck, even your smartphone now can measure lots and lots of stuff about you, including your GPS. Now we've seen Horizon One mostly play out by now. And really the key success factor is just giving users some sort of immediate utility from their data. Mapping my run, how did I sleep, what's my current heart rate, etc. With the benefit of hindsight, we also know who the key players are going to be. The tech companies like Apple, Google, Samsung all have major players in this space especially with Google's acquisition of Fitbit. Sports companies like Nike and Adidas have dabbled but haven't been so successful. And finally, we have more advanced medical diagnostic tools to measure things that an Apple Watch can't measure yet. So here's the thing. This space is already highly commoditized and fragmented. The winners are unsurprisingly turning out to be those companies who are able to collect deeper data than the others. Take Apple as an example. You've got your watch, you've got your phone, you've got lots of devices on you all owned by Apple that all talk to each other and are able to collect and create some sort of a complete picture of your personal data. All right, so let's move on to Horizon 2, which is platforms. Platforms are all about data consolidation. Think of it as a way to multiply the usefulness of your personal data by linking multiple data sources all together in a meaningful way. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to see how this would take the form of a unified dashboard that combines your social data, your fitness data, your dieting data, lots of different data together in order to create a holistic picture of yourself. The key success factor in this horizon is about giving consumers trust. We can trust one company with all of our various forms of data and trust that there won't be any kind of data breaches or misuse of that data. So who are the players in Horizon 2? Well, governments absolutely have a role to play, but as we know, they're kind of large and slow moving. There have been some e-health platform initiatives around the world, but as we've seen historically, these are kind of the laggards. They're rarely the ones who lead from the front of the industry. The tech giants, of course, are playing heavily into this space. I mentioned Google's series of acquisitions and partnerships in which they've built out a series of health things. Apple also interestingly have a partnership with Aetna Health Insurance. They're looking at how to build that ecosystem to supplement all of that consumer data they're collecting through their Horizon One devices. Now, there may be some other trusted brands that come along who are able to partner with interesting technology players. So for example, think about if everyone stops their obsession with blockchain to do with crypto, and we use blockchain as a health play, this could actually open up a lot of interesting opportunities. Horizon Two has begun, but it's still kind of in its early days. And obviously we're seeing some of the large tech giants establishing themselves and experimenting in this space. Now we get to Horizon 3, which is called services. And services are all around the application of that data. Think of it as a way to use the platform's consolidated data to provide predictive diagnoses and other healthcare services. Let's think about it this way. We've had data analysts for many years who are great at optimizing software and websites. What if we took our personal data and put that in the hands of a data analyst who was trained in the area of healthcare. Rather than turning up to the doctor and saying, hey, I've got a cough, these data analysts would actually be able to use your personal data to pick up on the fact that you're going to have that cough months or even years in advance of having the illness. Now, let's bring it back to AI. What would happen though, if rather than just being an assistive thing to help those human analysts, we plugged AI in at the source here. This would completely blow up healthcare as we know it. 
You would have a series of devices that's collecting all of your personal data. You would have an AI that's able to consolidate and make sense of all that data and not only predict when you're going to be ill, but prevent illness from happening in the first place. Now, this is not an entirely new concept, but there are some industries who are massively going to be affected by this. Obviously, the healthcare industry, but more broadly, what about pharmaceutical companies? If they don't have a business model selling drugs to sick people, then what's their role to play in it? What about insurance companies? They've traditionally been based on risk assurance products. Well, when we're able to use AI to massively shift your risk curve, insurance companies are really going to have to rethink that business model, shifting from the mindset of helping people in times of critical illness to becoming a service provider that prevents illness in the first place. That's a huge business model shift in a huge industry. And beyond the current health tech startups and the current healthcare system, we're going to see a whole range of new startups and new industries spring up around this kind of technology. The truth is the traditional players like hospitals and healthcare systems and governments are moving much too slowly to be able to capitalize on a wave like this. At the same time, we've unfortunately seen some of the traditional players like the pharmaceuticals and the insurance companies dragging their heels in order to maintain their current core business model. We've seen this many, many times before. This is operational inertia, a Kodak moment happening in real time in front of our eyes. So really the question becomes, will the healthcare industry be able to create data analytics and AI capabilities faster than the tech companies will be able to build healthcare capabilities? If I were to place a bet, I'd probably go for the tech companies. I think we're gonna see a lot of innovation coming from the health tech startup space powered by AI. What we'll also see then is over time, services being consolidated by the large tech players like Google, Apple, and Samsung, who already have heavy investments in the health tech space. In short, I think the innovators are gonna disrupt the incumbents quicker than it will happen the other way around. So if you believe in that vision, the logical question is, who will the winners be? I think this is one of those cases where there won't be one big winner. It's actually going to be an ecosystem of lots of companies working in tandem in order to shift and transform entire industries. But one thing is for sure, if any of these predictions come true and AI is actually able to help us live a happier, longer, healthier life, we're gonna have many, many, many years to look back on this point in time and think of how silly we were to think that ChatGPT was just this fun little toy to help us write an email. Thank you so much for watching the video all the way to the end. If you'd like to support the channel, please be sure to like and subscribe. If you like our content, check out our other videos and visit us at fivewaystoinnovate.com to find out more about our mission to help a thousand corporates reinvent themselves in order to build the business of tomorrow. I'm Ami Iqbal. Stay tuned and I'll see you soon.